Hello everyone, so today we are talking about stroke in this series where I'm talking about how you should be thinking like a medical registrar. Okay, so this will also help you towards your PACES exams because that's exactly what you're supposed to be doing anyway. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is uh, Dr. Vishal Kumar. I set up the uh, Keen Medic YouTube channel and the website where you can find my course and my book. So let's get started. So in this video, we're going to be talking about the unmissable diagnoses, the major things that you need to be aware of when it comes to stroke, uh, the factors that should alert you for each presentation, each different presentation of stroke, the stroke specific issues uh, that you don't find in, say, you know, other um, ischemic uh, events or hemorrhagic events that you will find in other specialties. Um, investigations and management uh, in stroke patients, followed by the follow-up, okay? So the unmissable diagnosis first. So like every other presentation, I like to talk about the life-threatening, the acute things first, okay? So that is always the advice I give. Um, as a registrar, as a PACES candidate, you should always think about what the patient will die of in the next few hours as the very first thing that you should be ruling out first, okay? Followed by everything else. So what will kill the patient first? The life-threatening stuff in stroke will be things like subarachnoid hemorrhage, okay, and intracerebral hemorrhage, so basically bleeding. It is uncommon for ischemic events which happen acutely to kill, uh, that kill the patient, okay? But hemorrhagic events, especially if they're big, will kill the patient. Okay, so there is the not so life threatening stuff, uh, especially if it is not a major territory infarct, okay? So this would be ischemic events. So ischemic events don't show up if you perform a CT head scan early on. By early on, I mean within the first few hours of the event happening. So the patient may well have the symptoms, and that's what usually happens in a thrombolysis call, where uh, the patient starts um, with symptoms and there's usually an acute onset, okay? And uh, uh, the symptoms start and persist. And it is important that the symptoms should persist because there should be ongoing ischemia around that area by a blocked um, artery, right? So whilst the ischemia is persisting, uh, if you do the CT head, usually it won't show anything. It would look like a normal CT head, okay? The reason why you do a CT head is to rule out hemorrhage, not to look for ischemia necessarily. Okay, so in terms of the different stroke syndromes um, and the different presentations, let's talk Let's talk about each of them then. So the first thing, intracerebral bleed. Um, if you have a patient who has come in with a sudden loss of consciousness without any warning, without any presyncopal warning, so, you know, like uh, feeling lightheaded, faint, palpitations, chest pain, anything like that, uh, and suddenly they pass out, one moment they're okay, one moment they're not, and also if they are on any form of anticoagulation, whether this is warfarin or novel agents like apixaban, rivaroxaban, for whatever reason, like atrial fibrillation perhaps, or recent pulmonary embolism, anything, then these should all alert you towards intracerebral bleed. What I've also found is that patients who are often agitated, okay, uh, patients who are not themselves as described by their relatives, their, their carers, uh, and also have some stroke features, um, may also have had a bleed. That is what I found. So agitation is another thing that you should think about when um, you know, you're thinking of stroke that might point you towards the bleed direction. Regardless, though, you would still do a, a CT head scan, wouldn't you? So you, the, the CT head would pick up the intracerebral bleed. So subarachnoid hemorrhage usually presents as the worst headache that the patient has had. Often it is sudden and occipital in location with uh, meningism. So they, they may well have neck stiffness and photophobia, and uh, the Koenig sign may or may not be present. So with sub, subarachnoid hemorrhage, CT head uh, can be done and should be done. 
However, it does not fully rule out the subarachnoid hemorrhage. So you have to proceed with a lumbar puncture if your suspicion is quite, uh, you know, high for uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. So you need to look for xanthochromia on lumbar puncture to rule out subarachnoid hemorrhage adequately. What we see very commonly is ischemic events uh, and ischemic events in the anterior circulation. So we'll talk about the anterior circulation first, followed by the posterior circulation. So the anterior circulation would be comprised of the anterior and middle cerebral arteries and usually the presentation would again be sudden. So remember, so it's usually a blood clot that has gone and lodged in one of the arteries and that causes ischemia downstream, right? So that would cause uh, symptoms in that region that it supplies. So usually this would present as unilateral weakness in the arms, legs, or just maybe just the arm or the leg. Um, doesn't have to be uh, both, you know, upper and lower limbs. Or they may have facial droop, slurred speech, or visual disturbances of some kind. Usually this is inattention or hemianopia because of the region that it supplies, okay? So these are these are the things that um, are very commonly seen in stroke, um, in stroke patients and in, in the UK there is something called FAST, F-A-S-T. So that's uh, that stands for face, arm, speech, and time. So that's what the ambulance crew use here in the UK to determine whether or not this should be a stroke call usually, okay? And it is also an easy way for uh, the public to remember and alert other people and call for uh, help, medical advice, medical help, uh, if they see someone having fast symptoms. So ischemia, we're talking about posterior circulation now. Again, it should be sudden um, and they will have uh, posterior symptoms of vomiting, dizziness, ataxia, cerebellar signs, or pupillary changes. So posterior circulation um, supplies the cerebellum and the brainstem area. So they, all of this uh, um, coordinates the, um, well, coordination of the body, right? So um, if you lose all of that, you can no longer function and perform meaningful tasks with your arms, legs, and uh, you can have pupillary changes. So this is what this is why when uh, an elderly patient presents with uh, sudden onset vomiting and some ataxia, we have to perform a CT head to look for evidence of stroke. Because this, while they may not have any weakness uh, or facial droop, they may well have had a posterior event leading to a posterior ischemic event. Okay, If you are watching this in other countries, in the UK what happens is that if the patient is within a certain window and they have got sudden onset of uh, stroke symptoms, then they are always considered for thrombolysis with alteplase in the UK. So an urgent CT head needs to be done immediately, the, uh, you know, within minutes of arrival in a &E. In some a &E, even, you know, what happens is that they will even go through the CT head um, first before they even see a clinician so that they have got that done and out of the way if it is a if it is a fast positive um, call from the ambulance okay so CT head needs to be done urgently to rule out hemorrhage that's the very first priority followed by the thrombolysis window which is four and a half hours so uh, the UK follow this guideline at, as it stands right now. Now, this is unlikely to be in your PACES exam because, um, well, you are not going to be in that acute of a setting, but never say never with PACES. You may well get a patient who has come in with stroke symptoms and it actually started two hours ago. And if that happens, you need to be thinking about thrombolizing and you need to be thinking about an urgent CT head. And if you are not the stroke team, then you need to be thinking about putting out an urgent thrombolysis stroke call wherever you are. OK, if you're not in hospital, then they need to be uh, in the ambulance straight uh, into A&E. That's what needs to be happening. OK, so NIHSS is a scoring system that is used to um, score patients for potential thrombolysis. So that's uh, it's, it's a huge table, which, again, you don't need, need to necessarily mem memorize. You need to be aware of that, uh, the fact that it exists and that you need to use it before thrombolizing patients. And you need to be aware of the contraindications for thrombolizing. And they, uh, some of them are things like being on anticoagulation, for instance. So uh, if a patient is on anticoagulation, for obvious reasons, you wouldn't thrombolize them because you, you, if you thrombolize them, then that they will just bleed to death, basically. Okay. 
Um, so the decision of thrombolysis should be taken by a stroke consultant. So in the UK, you have got specific uh, consultants for stroke, okay? And uh, uh, there is always uh, a 24-hour stroke consultant on call who should be consulted before thrombolyzing. Because of the risk involved with bleeding, you should not take this upon yourself to thrombolize patients unless it is literally a life and death situation and you know there is no way you can get any advice within the time frame that is probably the only way where only situation where you might be able to get away with it but honestly i would not advise you to take the decision in any other situation at all always go for the stroke consultant in your PACES exam as well, mention the stroke consultant, okay? Do all of this, say that you would do all of this, get all the investigations ready, uh, examine the patient, take the history, all of that, but the decision should rest with the stroke consultant. Okay, so the must-have things are these before you uh, talk to the stroke consultant, okay? So your vital signs, so these would be specifically the heart rate and the blood pressure, the blood sugar, ECG and CT head. So vital signs are needed because if their blood pressure is really high, let's say their blood pressure is 240 over 120, then this may uh, this may cause complications or in fact their stroke symptoms might be because of uh, such high blood pressure. So you need to bring the blood pressure down. In the stroke setting, usually it might be uh, IV beta blockers like labetalol. But I would advise, again, talking to the stroke consultant about it. Blood sugar is done because if they are hypoglycemic, then that can mimic stroke-like features, okay? So that's why you need to make sure that this is not a hypoglycemic event mimicking a stroke. So you need to uh, ensure that their blood sugar is adequately high uh, and, you know, they're not hypoglycemic, basically. ECG is to look for sinus rhythm. CT head, as I said earlier, is the must-have to rule out hemorrhage. So there are certain specific issues that stroke itself brings, okay? Because of the location that it affects, um, we need to take into, into consideration how it affects parts of the body and what that translates to in the life of the patient themselves. And these are things like driving. So if you have had a stroke, obviously, you know, you need to think about whether or not you can still drive if you can't drive for what period of time. So uh, in the first instance, uh, patients should be advised not to drive until they have been seen in the stroke clinic. Again, the uh, decision should rest with the stroke consultant, basically, because they have got the experience. So and in the patient setting and in also life, you are not the stroke consultant, right? You will be a registrar in some sort of specialty. So if you're not sure, either you seek the advice of the stroke team or send them to the stroke clinic. But driving is very important uh, because if they are paralyzed on one side, obviously they can't drive, okay? You don't have the level of uh, motor function or the coordination. The other factors include baseline function. So um, if they have been a, a very independent individual, despite the fact that they might be elderly, then they may well be, um, they may well be considered for thrombolysis. Whereas if, let's say, they are bedbound uh, for whatever reason, uh, because they have got such advanced dementia or they have got such advanced Parkinson's disease, etc., etc., then they may not be thrombolyzed uh, because their function is uh, so limited. Their job is important because, let's say, if they're an HGV driver or if they operate he heavy machinery, then that is completely different to if they are an office worker, okay? Handedness, right or left handedness, basically tells you which part of the cerebrum they are um, dominant, and that also is important for um, um, medical treatment. Swallowing for uh, to re to reduce the risk of aspiration. So sp speech and language therapy would be involved in the um, post stroke care and they would uh, advise advise you on whether or not patient can have the normal um, normal foods and normal fluids if not they will also provide the safest consistency speech speech and language will again be involved with this and mdt is a very key word that you need to be using when it comes to stroke so the MDT multidisciplinary team are always involved in a post-stroke uh, patient. So these would include the physiotherapist, the occupational therapist, speech and language therapist, 
as the very core and the very foundation for every single stroke patient. So they need to be involved in every single one of them. Let's say that uh, the patient has had a very significant uh, stroke and they can no longer swallow. Then you need to involve the relevant specialty, which is uh, the gastroenterology team to advise on whether or not um, a PEG tube might be appropriate for nutrition purposes. In terms of investigations and management, so you need to look for um, the causes of stroke, but you also need to uh, treat the stroke in, uh, itself, okay? So CT head followed by aspirin, okay? So CT head, as I said earlier, to rule out hemorrhage. Once you've ruled out hemorrhage, if they are within the window of four and a half hours and they are for thrombolysis following your consultation with this uh, stroke consultant, then you would thrombolyze, okay? Then you would give them aspirin uh, for uh, about two weeks. However, let's say they are out of the window, then you would still need to do the CT head to rule out hemorrhage. But then what you would do is give them aspirin instead, 300 milligrams, okay, for two weeks. You would need the ECG for um, the same reason as I said earlier, make sure they are in sinus rhythm. Blood glucose, again, HbA1c is to check that they are actually not diabetic, that it, HbA1c is well controlled. Uh, and lipid profile, again, to look at their cholesterol levels and see if they need uh, high dose uh, statins or referral to, say, chemical pathologists uh, if they might be hyperlipidemic. Coagulation profile to see if, you know, they have got normal coagulation. If not, why not? Have they got liver disease, for example? So this is the basic test that you need to be doing, also followed by uh, some considerations that often most patients, you know, end up having anyway. So these would be things like MRI head after the stroke to look for the degree of infarction. Uh, carotid dopplers if they have had an anterior circulation event. So carotid doppler will tell you whether or not there's uh, significant stenosis. And if there is st significant stenosis, then you should be referring to the vascular surgeons for carotid endartrectomy. 24-hour ECG to look for any uh, dysrhythmias, arrhythmias, okay, mainly for atrial fibrillation because that would be important for anticoagulation purposes. In younger patients, so let's say a patient who is under 20 has had a stroke, then that is a very significant event, right? So you need to be looking at why, you need to be looking at all possible avenues, all the rarer things that might be happening. So you need to do stuff like thrombophilia screen because uh, their blood might be hyper coagulable uh, for whatever reason. Maybe it's a vasculitic thing or maybe this is an autoimmune thing. And also things like echocardiogram to look for patent foramen ovale for paradoxical emboli. Okay, so aspirin for two weeks, uh, 300 milligrams is the standard treatment that everyone should be on as long as they haven't had a bleed in the brain. Followed by clopidogrel, 75 milligrams lifelong. Again, this is standard treatment and, you know, not everyone will be on exactly the same treatment for their own individual um, reasons um, assessed by the stroke team. So this is the general treatment that you should be aware of, okay? And risk factor management for stroke. So, or, you know, everything that could contribute to a stroke. So this would be statins to control their cholesterol, antihypertensives to control their blood pressure, smoking cessation to make sure they're not smoking if they are willing to have the smoking cessation advice. Because there's no good uh, referring them to smoking cessation advice if they are not willing to stop. And honestly, I've seen many patients who will still not stop smoking after a major heart attack or a stroke. So that does happen. Uh, and treating diabetes, of course. Uh, so this may be with oral hypoglycemic agents or insulin. And the one thing that you need to be aware of is to not give VTE prophylaxis. So this is a venous thromboembolism. So in hospital in the UK, what happens is if a patient comes in, then uh, often their mobility reduces because they're unwell and they're in hospital, right? Uh, so what happens is to prevent the risk of DVT, deep vein thrombosis, happening in hospital uh, and also pulmonary embolism, you give some kind of low molecular weight heparin usually, right, uh, for any patient. Like uh, this may be doltaparin, uh, enoxaparin, fonparinax, etc., etc. There are many different versions. 
But if a patient has had a stroke, you don't give it, okay? You do not give it because what happens is you can have a period where uh, after the stroke um, where you can have hemorrhagic transformation. And this is true for the ischemic strokes as well, where they've had an infarct, okay? So not just the hemorrhage. So if, if they've had a hemorrhage, obviously you wouldn't give any, um, you know, anticoagulation like any of these. But even in the ischemic strokes, you wouldn't give it for about two weeks, okay? Instead, what you would give is inter uh, intermittent pneumatic compression, so IPCs they're called, and in some trusts, it's, uh, there is a trade name called uh, Flotrons. You would give that instead, which the patient can have over their calves. Okay, and obviously they would need stroke follow-up after the stroke, after their acute admission. So, we've covered a lot in this video. Let's do a quick summary. First and foremost, stroke is vast. Always keep it as a differential. And if there is any suspicion, any doubt, always look for it. Thrombolysis is very important uh, to be aware of what NIHS as a score is and the uh, investigations you need. And the fact that you need a CT head to rule out a uh, bleed first and then commence treatment. Always involve the stroke consultant for um, decision making. There are loads of investigations and life implications that you need to be thinking about, such as driving, handedness, job, things like that. And always MDT, 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 okay? So stroke is a multidisciplinary management. It does not all the responsibility falls on you. The responsibility needs to be shared. Care needs to be shared. Otherwise, the patient won't receive the best care, um, and that's not how you deal with things essentially okay so mdt is very important regardless of whether you know it's an ischemic um, or a hemorrhagic event mdt is very important all right so i hope that you've learned a lot guys if you want to learn more make sure you check out my book on strategies available in the kindle format and also the paperback and my course as well with loads of features over here. So both will be linked in the description down below. I will see you in the next video.